everybody. Welcome. So today I have with me Diet Mossen. Okay, mm-hmm. right. From the <laughs> Northeastern Nevada Museum. And we're here in Elko, Nevada. And uh, it's a little dear to my heart because I'm actually from Carlin, Nevada. And um, I went against a lot of Elko and Spring Creek people in track. <laughs> and usually they kicked my butt. So... Um, But yeah, we're here at the museum today, and we've got a lot of really cool things to learn about that I had no idea about the history of this place as well. Um, So yeah, take it off. Well, so we're called the Northeastern Nevada Museum, which means that we cover all of Northeastern Nevada. So that means that we we talk about things that happen in Carlin, Elko. Um, There are some small mining mining camps in um, Jarbage and Tuscarora. They're now considered ghost towns. But both of those, we tell stories from both of those places. We go as far south as White Pine County to Ely, which is kind of crazy. Ely and Nevada is, is a, many people from the east might not realize, but this Nevada is, is a gigantic place. It is huge. So for a little bit of perspective, Elko is in the northeastern corner. We are four hours west of Salt Lake City. We are about five hours east of Reno and Carson City. And eight hours north of Las Vegas. Yeah, and that's driving and on that's interstate. by a car on interstate. Um, so that's that's kind of a little bit of perspective. Elko is like the center spot of all of that. Elko County is the fourth largest county in the nation by square mileage, which is totally crazy. We are beat out by Nye County is the third. Nye County is in Nevada as well. It's a little further south than us. And then there's a county in California and a county in Arizona that are number one and number two. But so we're fourth largest county by square mile square miles. And the museum covers all of that. And we talk about all of that within this museum. And so we, we were founded in uh, the Northeastern Nevada Historical so- Society it was founded in 1958. And 10 years later, they were able to open this museum right here in the city park. They were given the land by the city and they, with the stipulation that they begin building on it within a year. And so they built a basement which started to house all of the artifacts and everything that um, they had been collecting. Because prior to that, the members of the Historical Society had been collecting things in their garages and their basements and attics. Maybe now, not people the best would, place for artifacts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in some cases, not the best place. They were able to get Howard Hickson from the Nevada State Museum in Carson City to come out here. And he, he built many of our first exhibits that we had. And he became our fir- one of our first directors. And he actually served as director here for, I think it was 30 years. Um, so, I could be off in that time frame, but... So first they built the basement. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was just to house and everything? That was just, it was to house everything and to show that the building was coming to, to... That they were taking steps to building. Okay. And then they had to write... They wrote several grants. Um, the Fleshman Foundation granted them money at that time to continue the building and they received funding from the county our bylaws actually state that on our board of directors we have to have a county representative um so we're really lucky in our board of directors we have an amazing board of directors and um that county representative still sits with our board today and he's awesome we absolutely love him so that that's part of our bylaws is that because the county funds part of us we get that county funding, but it's not totally everything that funds us. So we are still a private nonprofit, and we do a lot of fundraising. A lot of people around here have heard of the Great Humboldt Duck Race. Uh, yes. We drop rubber duckies in the Humboldt River, and they float downriver and see who wins, who comes across the river first. People spend all summer adopting their rubber ducks, and they can come out to watch the race, and um, the winner will get $1,500. And, and never fear, all of the ducks are always They're collected. always collected, <laughs> yes. We have never sent anyone down, any of them down the river to Carlin. <laughs> um, we've had a few that have tried to make a break for it a couple times, but we have chased them. But the Great Humboldt Duck Race is something that's looked forward to every year. I mean, we have a blast with it. It's so much fun. And then our other fundraiser that we do is the Halleck Bar Party. Um, so the Halleck Bar, which we walked past it when you came into the museum, uh, the Halleck Bar came from Halleck, Nevada. It sat in the saloon there in Halleck and was restored by the Glacier family and Chotch Evans. And they, um, when they restored it and brought it back to us, they said, we want the museum to have this, but we have a stipulation. You have to pass a shot of Beefeater Gin over the bar every year. 
So we have the bar. We have the back bar, the mirror, and the place where they would hold the booze and everything. We have all of that. And it is the center focal point of our Halleck Bar Gallery, which is an art gallery that rotates art. And the bar itself functions as an active bar at least twice a year. I mean, and if you're in Nevada... Right? You know, There's you got to be a bar. Active bar. Exactly. There has to <laughs> be a bar. Even the museums here Yep. <laughs> bars. Um, the Pioneer, actually, is down in the Western Folklife Center. They have one of the most famous bars as well. <laughs> but, so we have the Halleck Bar Party because we have to pass the shot of gin over the, par- uh, over the bar every year. So why not have a blowout party? So we have a huge bar party. It's open bar. You pay $20 at the door to come in and... It's open bar for the rest of the night. You can party, there's dancing. We've had, um, we had live piano music one year, which was really fun. We had a local pianist come in and she played some of the really fun old bar tunes and stuff, which mm. was really, really fun. You know, I mean, obviously working here, you've seen so mm. much different history that we have here. And uh-huh. I say we because I definitely feel a little bit a part of You're this. You're a hometown girl. I'm a hometown girl. <laughs> um, and I know, you know, you say Nevada. Let's For all the people listening to this podcast yes. now, just so you know, if you want to sound like a Nevadan, it's definitely Nevada, not Nevada. So I'm just throwing that out there right now. Yes. <laughs> but so you do a lot of work with the public education side. Mm-hmm. And one of the really cool programs that you guys did here was about a very special eagle that has a, a deer place in Elko's heart. Yes, his name is Silver. He is a bald eagle. And so for for those of you that know about, you know, our country's emblem is the bald eagle. And they it is unlawful to hunt them. It is unlawful to have them taxidermied. It is, um, they are protected 100% by the United States. Yeah, you. I don't even think that you can be in possession of any eggs. Yeah. Um, hatched or not, or any feathers, mm-hmm. anything like that, even if it's collected from an already dead animal. And I would imagine that you would probably be fined for messing even with their with their nests. Mm-hmm. I know that there is a, a certain stipulation for Native Americans. I know mm-hmm. that they have something separate, but for right now, like general population rules... And the, Na- the Native Americans actually played a, a role in, in Silver as well in his story. Um, so he was, Silver was, as a young bird, he was shot in the wing in Alaska. And he was, his uh, medical rehabilitation took him from Alaska to San Francisco, to the San Francisco Zoo. And there he went under, he underwent some rehabilitation. And the, the intention there was that he and a female bird that that was also being um, rehabilitated there. The intention was that the two of them would be released back into the wild with 100% conservation in mind. At a time in 1974, the time that they first tried to release them into Mount Lassen, it was halted because of an early snowfall. And then the the two of them, they there had only been maybe 500 nesting pairs of eagles. And eagles, like if you know anything about eagles, they mate for life. They, they are together for life and they very much grieve, which was something that we learned last summer as well. And these two were to be released into Mount Lassen and it was stopped because of an, an early snowfall. And it took another couple of years before, so I think it was actually 1973, so they stopped for the early snowfall because they because were concerned that if they released them... Exactly. You know, they wouldn't right be able to survive yeah. because of the snow. And um, after being in San Francisco in a zoo, I mean, that was that was very tricky. And so then they, they timed things a little bit differently, and they ended up releasing the two of them into the Ruby Lake Wildlife Refuge here in Elko County. And as they released them... Some of the famous words said by his handler, Lair Coughlin. Um, Lair is a, he's become a great friend of the museum. He's an amazing, amazing guy. Uh, very talented and um, very passionate about the conservation efforts that have gone on. He was the person who, who released Silver. And, and as he released him up into the air and his arm went up, we have this really great picture of his arm in the air and Silver flying off of his arm. And his last words to Silver were, Silver, fly free. And that kind of became a big theme for us last year. So we, we celebrated the Summer of Silver. Silver got an all-new exhibit. He had been in an exhibit that was a wooden case with glass on both sides so that you could walk around him and see him. There was a TV screen that showed a slideshow of a 10-minute slideshow of his story. And it was narrated by um, local radio personality, Stu Ryder, at the time. 
it was recorded and it was put into the slideshow and all of this was part of the exhibit and the exhibit moved around. Like when I was little, I remember it being right by the front doors of the museum. And I used to, we used to drive down the road and I'd be like, can we go see Silver today? And so we would come in and we would, we would stop. And sometimes we'd say hi to Silver and other times we would watch the slideshow. Um, I talked to my cousin the other day. She lives in Reno now, but she grew up here as well. And she remembered having the lady behind the desk come out and push rewind on the video cassette so that she could watch it. So the, this has been a big part of everybody's lives. I mean, and he was, I mean, from what you were telling me earlier, he was basically like the community's pet. He, he kind been, of was. Unfortunately, as happens sometimes with rehabilitation mm-hmm. efforts, they become a little bit habituated to humans. Yes. And so he kind of hung around the area and became a really he did. popular bird. So, so when they were actually released, um, Jane Athena, the female, the female eagle that was released with him, she took off, flew over the hills, and was never seen again. She was done. <laughs> she was just, she was out of there. She was ready to be free, and she was done. Silver actually hung around, and they reported that he would come back to the Forest Service um, building, and he would take the fish that they would keep there in a, in a trough that they used to, in case, you know, when slipping, pickings were slim for the birds, they mm-hmm. could come back and they knew they could get food there. Um, but he was well known for talking anglers out of their trout. Like he would go and, or sometimes he would just steal it straight out of when their baskets. Talking, when talking didn't work. <laughs> yeah. He would, he would just go and steal it straight from their baskets as they were sitting out there on the lake fishing. And um, in our efforts last summer, as we were rebuilding this exhibit, so the original exhibit was a huge community program. Um, Silver was shot 10 months after being released and killed. And the man who killed him was a a retired police officer out of California, which makes it even more sad. Because he definitely should have known he should have that known. that's poaching. Yes. Well, and he was actually out there. He was l- legally hunting out there. But what he said was that he saw something white moving in the bush and he shot. And it's, I mean, the attitude is, of course, very different in a lot of places, Mm -hmm. and that's okay. We're definitely not trying to say that anyone should be a hunter, but we're just saying that in Nevada, (laughs) it's very popular. It's definitely, and it's definitely a way of life here. It's something that we grew up with. Yeah. Yeah. And so saying that you just shot at something in the bushes. Yes, you're you're like, "Eh, what? eh." what (laughs) Yeah. And he was discovered because he then broke the law a little bit further. And took him to a local taxidermist, and the taxidermist recognized Silver because he had seen him himself, mm. and he turned him in. Um, people were extremely upset in the community because, A, this this legend had been killed, mm. and B, the um, hunter was only fined $550. He was sentenced to six months in prison, and that was um, commuted to time served because of an illness that he had. Um, so it's very sad, and the people were pe- people were extremely upset and and rightfully angry over this. And so the community, Howard Hickson and um, Lair Coglin, Silver's handler. They went through all their channels. They started petitioning the government, the federal government. Um, President Nixon sent, uh, we have a letter and a coin of approval from President Nixon to give it, giving us his permission for us to have silver then preserved and put on exhibit here. Because that is that is something that is still nationally illegal to have them even, even in an exhibit. So we got all the permissions from the government. We had to go through the, the Native American tribes, um, the Shoshone and the Paiute tribes here in Elko, and have their permission and blessings to to have this exhibit created. And Silver was then taken back to California. He was preserved and then flown back to Elko for his in- exhibit installation in 1976. And it, it was kind of kind of timely because 1976 was the bicentennial of the United States. But also, it was a little bittersweet for us to have that exhibit brought here. And so as it was installed that year, the community raised funds. They collected 77,000 aluminum cans to to have recycled and raised funds for the exhibit. Um, The local Lions Club and Rotary Clubs of of the community, they both donated... um, very, uh, various other service service clubs of the community donated back to this exhibit. And so 
there was a lot, there was a huge community effort put into installing this exhibit in 1976. And they held a champagne toast and reception to open the exhibit then. And um, Lair Coughlin, uh, he came and he he dedicated that first exhibit with Howard Hickson as, as a co-speaker. And so when th- this exhibit over the years, it had moved from being in the front and center of the museum by the front doors to being put back in a corner and kind of, kind of forgotten a little bit. And my, my coworkers here at the museum, we, we grew up coming here. This was one of our favorite places. Silver is a huge part of our memories just as an exhibit. So we felt that this was a great injustice and we wanted Silver to have a new and amazing exhibit. So we reinvented his exhibit for him. He now has an interactive touchscreen television that will show you a map of the Ruby Wildlife Refuge. You can go through different um, facts about eagles and learn things about what they, how they live and where they live and things like that. And you can learn about their size you can measure your wingspan by, based on a wingspan, um, a drawing that our our registrar, Robin Nunez, um, created. She, she drew a comparison of an eagle, a California condor, a red-tailed hawk, and a barn owl, I, I think. Um, and you so can you can, use one of those. You, you just yeah, you just and... stretch your arms out like kind of like I th- I know the zoo has I know Hogle Zoo in Salt Lake City has one for ca- for gorillas. You just stretch your arms out and lay your arms against the wall to see how how far your arm spread is and like your wingspan you know t- compared to the wingspan of these birds. So that's really really fun. Like you can just stand up against that and then you can maneuver through the touch screen and you can watch Silver's story. There are two different versions of the story on there. There's one that is 30 minutes and goes into a lot of detail and then there's one that's 10 minutes and it's it's brief and um, kind of the reader's digest version but still gets the point out. And all of it is in the name of bald eagle conservation efforts. Um, so we started creating this and we went through what we called last summer um, the Summer of Silver. Everything that we did last summer was all about silver. I started in April of last year, just after the school district spring break, and I visited all of the schools in the in Elko, and a couple out of Elko as well. And I went to them and I said, can we get this story out? We want all of the kids to know the story. We want them to learn about silver. And we are collecting aluminum cans to recreate the aluminum can drive that they had in 1976. And many of their parents will actually still remember silver. If they from did. This area. And actually, it was really kind of funny because the story, I, I, I get teary talking about it all the time. Like, I, I tear up. And by the fourth or fifth time that I had gone into a principal's office to talk about it, I kind of stopped getting quite as teary. And then I went to the Elko High School and I talked to Tim Wickersham and Mr. Wickersham is amazing. But um, as I was sitting there talking to him and telling him what we were doing, he was like, I remember Silver. He landed on the street right in front of me. It turned out to be the coolest thing ever because he was very passionate about involving the school. He sent me three of his students, three of his junior juniors, um, junior athletes, They came over and met with me one day and they said, well, this is what our plan is. They held a spare change drive throughout the school. They put um, water jugs in every classroom and they said that the the first jug that they put down and they talked about it, they had their teachers talking about it. Their teachers all knew everything. You know, I'd given them a flash drive of the video that they passed around they actually, like the teacher started talking about it. And he said that as soon as they put those jugs out, they had people emptying their pockets. They actually brought in $500. Just those three high school boys brought us $500 for the exhibit, which was the coolest thing. Those kids worked so hard. And it was it was amazing to have that community involvement. When all along Silver's story, every step of the way has been really strong community involvement. It really has. And that was what our goal was last summer was to just involve the community. I mean, we we figured there's no way that saving aluminum cans today would raise that much money. But we figured that if every little kid brought in a bag of aluminum cans and said these are for Silver, they would at least know who Silver was. And then we held a very family-friendly reception at, in August of last year um, to commemorate the 45th anniversary of his original exhibit being opened. 
we had an entire week of events starting with our second Saturday activity for kids and their families. The kids came in, they learned about silver, they got to see the exhibit um, before it was officially opened, and they made their own bald eagle masks that some of them even wore to the reception, which was really kind of cool. Uh, we had a guest lecturer that that day. Uh, Larry Coughlin came in and he, he spoke and he had his daughter speak, who is actually, she works for the zoo system in San Francisco. And so they both spoke on conservations and we learned that bald eagles are no longer on the endangered species list because of the conservation efforts that they made in the 70s. Uh, they, they've been removed from the endangered species list, which is super awesome. Mm -hmm. And then it ended the whole, we ended the whole week with our champagne toast and reception. And it was, it was an incredible community involvement. It was just amazing. And the whole exhibit is wonderful. We still send people up there and tell them, you've got to go see Silver. But Silver the Bald Eagle is not, a, is a story that is not told anywhere else. No, it's very unique to this area. It is. And, and so one thing that is also pretty cool is I had no idea about this and I'm from a railroading town. That's where I grew up. Uh -huh. But as you were just saying, everyone has railroad stories, you know, mm -hmm. because it was such a big deal. But you guys have something very specific here that wasn't supposed to be part of Elko's history, but became a really important part of Elko's it history. It was. Um, the city of San Francisco train crash. So the, in 1939, on August 12th, 1939, there was a train crash that happened about 26 miles west of Carlin near what's called the Harney Station and also the Bell Ranch. is. And the Bell Ranch, actually, I don't think it's called the Bell Ranch anymore, but it's still there and it's still a ranch. And Carlin, so we're in Elko right now, mm -hmm. and Carlin is about 20 miles to the west, west of, us. of us. And yep. I mean, it's pretty closely tied to Elko. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're kind of like sister towns almost. Everyone knows. They, yeah, they really kind of are. And it's not it's not a big deal for someone in Carlin to drive into Elko every day for every work. Day for work. Yeah. yeah. So that 20 miles really isn't that big of a deal unless it's snowing. And it's and we're connected by Interstate 80, which is kind of a big deal as well. That's another whole other part of Elko history. But Interstate 80 drives goes right through Elko and Carlin both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like when we when we bring up, you know, that this happened it's, in Carlin, it was also pretty much happening in Elko as well. Exactly. Yes. And so this train crash when when it came through, it initially came through Elko. And um, we actually have interviews that Howard Hickson had conducted several interviews with the um, with various people who had been involved in the crash at the time. And he interviewed uh, a surgeon that we had here in Elko. His name was Thomas Hood. And he, at the time that this happened, was just a recent high school graduate. That they were going into the theater and the train tracks were directly in front of the theater. So... And so they said that they stopped and they watched the city of San Francisco train come through town. And he remembered thinking that there probably wasn't a single person in Elko that had ever been on that train because it cost an extra $5 just to get a ticket. So this was very much a luxury train. It really was. In fact, our exhibit is titled The City of San Francisco, The Titanic of Trains, because as far as Titanic was billed for... Uh, being luxurious and the height of, you know, travel, the best way to travel. The, the city of San Francisco was the same thing, only in train form. And they, um, it had roomette cars. There were like full apartments, like that, like bed and, and apartment cars. There's, there's, um, like pamphlet pictures that show women looking in mirrors and curling their hair in one of these apartment cars. There was a full bar. There were several dining cars. There was an actual like full restaurant car and then a, a slightly less fast food type car. You know, like you would think of it as like being the difference between uh, the high dining and then like McDonald's, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of and a, com a comparison of today. But that was kind of how it was. And then there were club cars and, and everything had like these these plush, luxurious seats. And there was a full barber. They had a medical car for um, anybody who became sick. Uh, they could go to this car. And there was a stewardess who was a nurse. And she would tend to them and take care of them until the next stop. And it's this train, it was a quarter of a mile long. And only for passengers. It didn't carry cargo or anything like that. It was a passenger train. 
and you could move between from car to car and your like your room car you could go from your room car out to one of the club cars and some of the stories that we've read are of people that were playing they were playing cards right before it crashed well and part of the reason why none of the people from elko would be on that is because elko was more of a oh, i don't want to say poor person town but it was more of a Poor person town. (laughs) That kind of was. And at the same time, it never even stopped in Elko. It stopped in Carlin and changed drivers. Not people, definitely. Not people, but drivers. And so most of the time, like, they were literally going from, it started in Omaha, Nebraska, and it made the trip from Omaha to Oakland, California, in just under 48 hours. Which now seems like an eternity. But, but back then, in the day. it was that was a big deal. It was a very fast moving train, and for it to be so luxurious and everything, you know, it w- it was a very big deal. There is one account that we have of a man who started his journey in New York City and had planned to end in San Francisco, and he um, he actually pay- paid an extra eleven dollars. Which I mean, today that doesn't seem like a lot, but in 1939 that was a lot, and it, just so that he could get to to San Francisco like that much earlier. Mm-hmm. And so he he got on a train in New York City, changed onto the the city of San Francisco in Omaha, and then his journey ended in the Carlin Canyon with all of with the train crash. Um they changed they changed drivers in Carlin and the driver there noted that they were 26 minutes late. He then said that he could throttle up across the flats of Nevada and and pick up that speed, and they would still make they would still make Oakland on time. This is sounding a little bit reminiscent of uh, Titanic, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. This isn't so, up. like the, this whole comparison is that was it's a very good comparison there. So they, as he got on the train, and they went through, they made it. I think they made it about twenty miles to the west of Carlin into the canyon. And looking at pictures of that canyon, I and mean, for for those of you in the east, you, you mountains are are different there, uh, which we had, we had talked about before starting this. Mountains are very different in the east, um, but this canyon that they were in, there was a mountain on one side, train tracks, and then a mountain on the other side, and the tracks literally hugged the mountain. And they went in a tight curve right around the mountain. Which is always really hard for something traveling at high speeds anyway. Yes, exactly. And he was not supposed to be traveling faster than 50 miles per hour. And But as um, you said earlier, he could make up that time that they He lost. could make up that time. So th- eventually there was a court of inquiry held after the crash. He, he hit it. He hit this curve. The engine stayed on the tracks. But further back, the the cars, they became tangled with a bridge that was going over the Humboldt River. And it's tangled with bridge trussing. And it it was a mess of, of metal and just broken pieces, broken train parts, broken track. And, and all of it was in the river. So it was and really a derailment from like the third train car back. It was, yeah. Um, the, and even the third car was slightly off the track. Like you could see that there, we have pictures of it where the wheels are kind of lifted off the track to, and tilted to the side. And the engineer actually ran a mile and a half down the tracks to the Harney station where he called for help and was able to get help. Um, Joe Bell was, he was 11 years old, but he was one of the ones that Howard Hickson interviewed and he remembered his dad and his brother and he all got into the truck and they took the engineer back. They got into their truck and took him back to the crash site, and they were among the first to arrive there to start helping people. And he said that all they could hear were just screams of people, the dead and the dying. And and there were people, um, the gentleman that started that I told you about that started in New York City. He actually had been in the um, the club car with four other people, and they had been playing cards and were. All four of them were thrown from the car out to the ground. And he said that he remembered laying in a pile of rock. There was rocks under his back. So he he had memories of that. And he said that he remembered being in great pain and talking to people around him, the people around him. And over the course of the night, the three that were around him, like they didn't want to move him because they didn't know you know, they didn't want to injure him further. And so they were very much waiting for doctors to come. 
How how many people were on the train? There were 220 total. So that counts. That includes the 171 people who were passengers. And then the rest were um, stewards and um, engineers, staff. engineers, staff, people who worked on the on the train itself. And uh, he described as he was laying there, he said that the three people around him, he he was talking with them and then before too long one by one they just stopped talking and the other three he was the only person who survived out of that car in the end there was 24 total dead 17 were discovered in the first at the crash site at the site there the others um made it to the hospital but succumbed to their injuries in the days following the cool part about elko and this history is that our doctors went out there. Our doctors, um, Tom Hood, he he was the one that I mentioned was going into the movie theater. He and his friend got out of the movie theater and immediately heard about it and went out to the crash site. That's how come this is so embedded in this history. It's it, not because yes. of like the crash happened, but it's more of the entire community effort. Everybody, you said exactly. that everyone went out there in the middle of the night and tried to help and do it. They, they all were out there. This happened at 930 at night. And they, so, I mean, it's getting dark. It, and it was August. So, you know, the sun was still up for a little while, but it was getting dark. People lined the roadways above the, above the site. They lined the road with lights so that they could see what was going on down there. Uh, there was a lot of stumbling around in the dark. Some, some of the passengers had lit a fire. There are so many different stories. And at the time, you had asked me about radio communication. So Elko did not have a radio station until 1954. So the only communication that they had was via telegraph and the Elko Daily Free Press. And the Free Press was the only open line of communication because the railroad, as soon as the railroad officials got there, they took over the telegraph. So people, like people coming out of the train and everything, they couldn't even send a telegraph to their families to tell them that they were all right. They wanted everything to be quiet. They wanted they wanted everything to be quiet until they could figure out what had happened. And they, um, so they took over the telegraph. So people couldn't even get word out. The Elko Daily Free Press was fielding phone calls from every major newspaper across the country, from New York, San Francisco, Chicago, every newspaper. This was big, big news. It was huge. And the free press was the only, they were the only way of getting news out there. And so they, uh, they reported on the, on the crash for two weeks following everything. You know, they reported on the, the board of inquiry that was followed, followed. The crash site was ruled sabotage. The railroad officials determined that someone had pulled spikes from the railroad and sabotaged the tracks. And that is what had caused the derailment. But there's um, a lot of controversy. There is a lot of controversy. And bring in bring in the theories. <laughs> because <laughs> so there is a lot of controversy actually about that because the board of inquiry was closed to the public. It was closed to news sources. So the newspaper wasn't even welcome in their in their courtroom. They were not allowed to um, report on anything that was occurring in there. The Elko's Elko's mayor, David Donna, was a part of the inquiry. Uh, he he gave he listened to testimony. They they spoke with the engineer um, Ed Hecox. They determined that he was not at fault, uh, that his speed was within within regulation, and that he it was nothing that he did to um, there was nothing that he did to cause this. In fact, there is a little a little article on probably page two of the newspaper about three weeks after the crash that he returned returned to work. But they, um, all of that was very, it was very, kept very hush hush. And once the FBI arrived to help investigate, they closed down the site. The public was not allowed to go in there. But I mean, this makes sense because evidence was being destroyed. Well, because didn't you say something? It took like, like three days. Three days to clean the wreckage out. The wreckage, mm-hmm. and there was just all kinds of people walking all over and and volunteers going in there. Yes, and actually, there were even people who were stuck in train cars that had obviously died, and it took them three days to get them out. It was just mass it was carnage. Just, it, it really was, and I mean, and. For 220 people and there are only being 24 that died, that is probably a miracle because of this wreckage. To see the pictures of it, it's just, 
it, it when I see it's a mess of metal and, and twisted tanglement, it's really bad. And some of those images, we have a million pictures, more than what are in our um, our exhibit. And they're just the the things, the images that you see there. It's impossible to imagine. And the images that are here are actually the, the, the exhibit. It has you can see all these different photos mm -hmm. on there. It's like a nice little backlit exhibit. Um, and that's where you can actually see some of the, the train crash and some of the cleanup crews after and everything. Yes. And they had to bring in they brought in um, other trains on the on the eastbound tracks and they moved people back and forth. The mortuary provided the ambulance service, which was really kind of a funny story because the ambulance was also a hearse. And um, Leo Puccinelli was a local d district attorney here in his adult life, but he was just a young high school graduate at the time. And he, uh, he was working for the mortuary and they told him, go get the hearse and, and drive it out. You're going to have to bring these victims back from Carlin to the hospital here. And so he took the hearse out there. He said that one of the first people that he put on there, she recognized it for what it was and thought that this was the end. Like, <laughs> poor, poor thing. I mean, yeah. what, else, what else do you picture when you wake up from a wreck and you're in a hearse, you know? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of disconcerting. Um, she she was just like, what is what's happening here? You know, and they had our hospital was very small at the time. Elko General Hospital played a huge part in it, though. All of the victims were brought back to Elko Hospital and checked out. Many of those that were not injured were released immediately. Others remained in the hospital until transportation could be arranged for them. Some of them went on to California. Others were taken to Salt Lake or to Reno to a larger hospital. Our hospital at the time only had 52 beds and there was 220 people on that train. So we had people lining the hallways of the hospital and we had doctors. All of the Elko doctors were on call that night. We were actually short by a couple of doctors that had gone, they were out of town. And we had one doctor that was from San Francisco that was visiting in Elko. And he, he showed up at the hospital and said, I'm volunteering my skills. I, I mean, can that's help kind you. Of what, that's what the whole community did. It, yeah. And like, even from just, you know, you know, the farmers, they went uh -huh. down there and were carrying bodies out. Yes. I mean, it was a real community and, effort. And Tom Hood, like he said that once they got out there, he and his friend were told, grab the corner of a mattress. And so they had four people on a mattress. Everybody grabbed a corner and they started carrying people out on mattresses out of the train. And the placement, you mentioned our exhibit, the placement of our exhibit here, we, we intentionally chose it because it is going in next to a new exhibit that we're still, it's still under construction at the moment of about our hospital and the history of the Elko General Hospital. And then it is going, so the people, the passengers had been taken to the Elko General Hospital. So it would go logically next to the hospital exhibit. The both exhibits are across the way from an exhibit of the Elko Daily Free Press, which is we have a printing press from the Free Press, which is really kind of a cool, it's a cool little bit of history itself because the Free Press is one of the oldest papers in Elko County. And so it's right across from there because the Free Press was, they were the ones who were the only source of news at the time. Mm -hmm. And then right next to the, the Free Press is an exhibit about the Reinhardt's um, department store. Reinhardt's was a store that was here for 90 years. It was owned by a German family. They actually started their journey in Canada, came down through California, got on the railroad, got on the train, and started traveling to the east from California as the Central Pacific Railroad was being built. And they ended in, in Elko. They were like, this is a great place to set up shop. So they built this store and they became an iconic part of Elko history. And during the crash, the days after the crash, they went through their department stores, the women's and the men's departments, and collected clothing, hats, gloves, pants, dresses, shoes. They took all of it to the hospital and provided that, that clothing for any of the victims that were coming out of the hospital. Because people lost, they lost everything that they were traveling with. They had nothing to come from the hospital. And, of course, the railroad paid for it and reimbursed them. But it's still kind of a really cool part of Elko's history that there there really was full community involvement. Everyone got involved. Everyone did. And so kind of going back a little bit to the conspiracy theory, I mm -hmm. guess they, they had originally determined that it was sabotage. Someone mm -hmm. was pulling 
um, railroad ties out and had purposely caused it. Yes. But I know, what are some of the alternative theories? So the railroad tie theory with the sabotage and everything, and they they kind of cemented that theory because they actually launched a manhunt. There is still outstanding a $10,000 reward offered by the Southern Pacific Railroad to anyone with information about the saboteurs. And they they actually arrested several men. None of them, they all alibied out of it. You know, they were all released. And uh, plus, the investigation started three days after. Yeah, like it officially really started after everyone had already been in there. And so, you know, whoever it was, they were definitely long gone. I have spoken with someone locally who did a lot of research. She researched the um, nurse and and has kind of performed as the nurse um, from the train in our, we do a, um, there's a downtown ghost walk. And so she, they have different people who dress up as, as different people from Elko history. And they tell their story in ghost, like as they're, as a ghost, um, they tell the story from first person perspective. So she researched, she did a lot of research and she actually read an account of two people in a bar just South of Carlin that were bragging about having messed with the railroad. Um, These people were never caught and nobody could ever identify them or anything like that. And then there were other, other theories were that the railroad was hiding something. They were covering it up, claiming sabotage, but covering up the fact that their tracks were in disrepair. And I'm personally inclined to, I, I lean toward a combination of the two personally. I think that the engineer did get a little overexcited because coming around that curve, it does open out into flat ground. And I think that perhaps he had started throttling up just a little early. And I do think that somebody pulled spikes because they they had proof that someone pulled some spikes out of the railroad. But I don't think that there's any way they could have known what train would loosen them, what train would actually come across there and be wrecked. Uh, they had no way of targeting the city of San Francisco. So I think the railroad company and the tracks were the target in the sabotage, not the train itself. And the train just had the bad luck of hitting that iceberg. There are a lot of people, um, we have some photos that were written that they had been inscribed on the back by the photographer saying, you know, don't let this out of your hands because we're all waiting to see what the railroad will do. The railroad company was very much taking, like they were confiscating anybody's pictures. Um, Chris Sheeran of the newspaper, I think it was Chris Sheeran, but he, um, his camera was confiscated and his, his photos were taken by the railroad and used in their, um, they were later, I, I think some of them were later returned to him, but they were, they were used in the court of inquiry and they were taking anything that could potentially like, they were saying it was evidence, but a lot of people felt like they were taking anything that could show that the negligence the railroad on was, their part. yes, negligence or that it was a cover up. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of people, and there were a lot of locals. Like, if you can find anybody around today that remembers that, or if they ever heard stories from their uncle or their grandparents or somebody that was out there, they will tell you that a lot of people thought that it was a railroad cover-up and that it was it was just negligence on the railroad part. Mm-hmm. So there is there is that controversy, and it's it's pretty c- cemented in local lore. You know, like, it's handed down from fam- in families and everything. But... Um, the official report says sabotage. They never caught the people who did it. And like I said, there's still a $10,000 reward out there for anybody who knows something about the sabotage. And anyone who knows something, if you're hearing it from this podcast, I think it's only fair that I get at least 50% of yeah. that for bringing it to your ears. <laughs> I'm just saying for future for future possibilities. Um, you could always make a donation back to the museum as well. You know, oh, fine. Happily take donations. <laughs> I guess that's probably better than just putting it in my pocket. <laughs> Well, this has been really wonderful. And, Thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to come back later, actually, and um, take take another tour around and look through the museum. Mm-hmm. But I've definitely enjoyed this, and it's been really cool to kind of get back to my roots and <laughs> learn some more. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dea. This has been really wonderful. Thank you.